Okay. All right. So first order of business, any other updates on um, our juror 204 lease that takes effect tomorrow? Your Honor, the state has no objection to the court excusing juror 204 for residency requirements. I don't want to excuse. I really don't. But I think that we'll have a legal impediment at the time of the verdict. That's that that would be the courts, even though the I mean, I don't know what how how a ruling would come down on that, but I, I don't want to take that chance. And under the circumstances, since there is that I believe request on the part of the defendants, we definitely would not want to object. But yeah, they're 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 preserving their um uh, their their rights, but I don't think they're objecting um either. Is that correct, Mr. Steele? Yes, we've not been consistent. We are, we are, yes, we are asking for her to be removed, so we don't believe the issue. That's exactly right. Okay. okay. As long as that's the case, we don't have any objection. As okay. long as every one of them is asking for Anybody her wish to be heard on that issue at all? Um, my, pre my Like I said, my preference would be to leave her, but I don't think I have a legal basis to leave her. And um, my concern would be that if she is here at the time of the verdict, she would not be a qualified juror because she would not be a resident. And Your Honor, if um, each of the defendants could, uh, if the court will allow each of them to just on the record, um, either make no objection to the removal or ask that she be removed so that there is no issue. Okay, in all right, Mr. Weinstein. There's no objection, no. Mr. Matthew Sr. No objection. All right, Mr. Steele, we've, ca ca we've captured your response. Um, Mr. Botts. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Garner. All right. And Ms. D. Williams. No Did I miss anybody? Okay, I don't think so. All right. Okay, so at the conclusion of today, we'll go ahead and excuse her, okay? Thank you. All right. Anything else I need to take up before we call our jurors? Yes. Yeah. Uh, with respect to uh, the system outage that has occurred, as the court is aware, of you talking the, about the you talking about Odyssey, or are you what are you talking about? I'm talking about the internet, figure. the ability for uh, the defense bar to be able to access the the internet and be able to grab and capture our uh, files to be able to do our legal research. It's my understanding, I of course it hadn't been confirmed, but I believe the district attorney's office is on their own network, private network, so they're able to access, whereas we are having to depend on hotspots which are spotty, which are sometimes uh, shaky in terms of being able to keep the connectivity. So we are asking uh, as the defense bar to be able to allow IT to come in and perhaps put a hotspot here in the courtroom or something of that nature so that we can have access to the internet at all times, Judge, respectfully. We have there, there's full co-public, and that is, I believe, on uh, on at this point in time. We have no access. You should be able to, because anybody in the courthouse, full co-public. Can't get on. And I don't know how you get on. Get on. I'm on it right now. Yeah. And and I, I'm on my device. We, it, we, we can mobile on, Your Honor, but we can't get internet access through right. that, through that Wi-Fi network. Is there anyone in the, on our side that is able to get on full code, full, Fulton County Public? All right. I, 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 you know, I can't, I can do that. That's, that's, because that's open to the public. That is, that is what everyone who comes in the courthouse to include the courthouse crowd, unless we have a, uh, <clears throat> know that the court, each chambers has a secure system. Right. So it's right. not working for us. Full code public is not working. It hasn't worked. It has to, to, to put on the record. It has not worked all last week and it hasn't worked any of this week. I can make a phone call, but, um, that's the best I can do in terms of, in terms of checking the, um, um, access, but, um, Okay. Say again. It's not 
Would you sit down, please? Yeah. You, know, you were doing so well too, Mr. Botts. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I'll make. I'll make. It, I'll make an inquiry. We'll see. What we Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. All right. Um. chance for you to call Aaron and find out if you can troubleshoot the Wi-Fi here and kind of and see. Um, because yeah, because they apparently the water lobby is Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. Um, I have made a call, Mr. Matthews, and we'll see what we can do for you, okay? All right. Um, Ms. D. Williams, do you have your order? Or has it been uh, entered as uh, prepared and entered as of yet? Okay. Um, imminent, Monday, Tuesday? That's the end on when we have our break, can you call and find out, um, tell her that I asked about, you know, about um, the order? Yes. Or if you'd like uh, just to, to loop, send an email or have your lawyer send an email and loop me in on it so I can do a reply all. Yes. Yeah, because then, you know, they, people might be more interested if, I, if they know that I'm interested. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So I would just invite you to do that. Maybe we can close the circle on that. Okay. All right. Um, jurors for us please thank you i'll tell our jurors as well um counsel that about the 27th when we're going to work and they don't need to be here so that'll be the first thing i'll tell them okay all right
around so dirty. Please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good afternoon. All right, let's start out with some announcements first, okay? All right, um, we're going to work till probably around a little before four o'clock, and then we're going to, uh, that'll, be, that'll be our work day for today, okay? Um, Monday, You'll need to be here at about 10, for 10.30 for an 11 o'clock start time. We'll work from about 11 to about 4. On the 27th of February, that's Tuesday. Um, that will be an administrative day for you, okay? That's that Tuesday. Tuesday the 27th. Uh, 28th will be a regular work day. We'll start at 10 hundred hours, uh, between 10, 10, 10 and 10.30. Um, Thursday the 29th, um, we will start around 9.30. And on the 1st of March, we will have a regular work day from about 9 uh, until about 4-ish or thereabouts. Um, that's, our, that's our work week. And then, you know, the following week, we'll work on Monday, that's the 4th. And then the 5th through the 12th. Um, you will be on, you'll, you'll be on a, uh, it, it will be an administrative period for you as well. So that's kind of the next couple of, couple, three weeks. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, state ready. Call your next witness. The state calls senior patrol officer Antonius Black. All right. Summon Antonius Black, please. Officer Black, good afternoon, sir. Sir, if you would please approach the witness stand. Once you get there, if you would be so kind to turn and face our name room to be sworn as a witness before you sit down, sir. <laughs> Senior Police Officer Antonius Black. First name spelling, A-N-T-O-N-I-U-S. Last name, B-L-A-C-K. Good morning, Senior Police Officer Black. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing okay. I can say good afternoon. All right. Um, where are you currently employed? Uh, City of Atlanta Police Department. And how long have you been employed there? With the City of Atlanta Police Department since June 2003. And what zones have you worked in APD? Zone 3. Are you still currently working in Zone 3? Yes, sir. Now, what part of the city would you describe Zone 3 uh, is in, in the city of Atlanta? Basically, it is southeast and also southwest side of Atlanta. And in your time working in Zone 3, what kind of crimes have you responded to? Probably all. And have you worked different beats within Zone 3? Yes. Now, this may be difficult to tell the jury, but if you had a ballpark, how many crimes have you responded to in zone three in your career? Uh, I can't even tell you. I don't. It's too many That's to keep up. Now, how many people have you interacted with in zone three? It's going to be the same answer. It's too many to keep up throughout the years. Is it hundreds, thousands? Thousands. And of the people you interacted with while on duty in Zone 3, how many were suspects in a crime, victims in a crime, or something else? I want to say you probably half and half. How familiar are you with the neighborhoods within Zone 3? 
I should be very familiar with it. And how would you describe the residents of Zone 3? Are they hardworking people? Yes, sir. Now, and based on your years patrolling Zone 3, are the majority of people in Zone 3 law abiding citizens? <laughs> Sustained. <laughs> Officer Black, with your personal experience working in Zone 3 since, was it 2003, you said? That's when I started with the City of Atlanta Police Department. Went through the academy, got assigned in 2004. How would you describe the majority of the citizens that you personally interacted with in Zone 3 in terms of being law abiding? I don't know, it's speculation and relevance. I stay in the objection. Were the majority of the people that you personally interacted with in Zone 3 suspects? You don't have to the same question objection. I stand the objection. Are you post-certified, Officer Black? Yes, sir. Were you post-certified in September 11th of 2013? Yes. Now, on that day, what was your assignment? You know, I was seeing police officer actually was field training. Uh, I was assigned a particular beat. I cannot recall exactly which beat I was assigned to, but it was in Zone 3. What uh, location were you operating in that day in terms of roadways in Zone 3? Uh, basically, I was working the B sector of Zone 3, which is from Arthur Lakeville, which is 166, everything southbound up into the Clayton County line. Who were you field training that day? Uh, Ashley Davis at the time. Did she go by Ashley Matthews now? Yeah, she has been married since. And uh, can you kind of describe what your role is like you're training her and you doing back then? Uh, basically teaching her, uh, guiding her uh, about being a, a patrol officer. And did you, uh, while you were on patrol with her that day, um, did you ever uh, wind up on the corner of Cleveland Avenue and Old Hayfield Road? Yes. What is... Uh, when y'all were there, what is that location? Uh, basically, we was at a corn laundry right down the corner of Cleveland and Old Hayville. Uh, we was about to do a direct patrol at that particular corn laundry place. Now, are you familiar with that location and kind of the surrounding area at Corn Laundry? Yes, sir. I want to talk with you uh, a little bit about that area. <laughs> Publishing what's been previously admitted as Sex Exhibit 134, Charlie. And also, lack of screen to your left, there's a bigger one behind you, whichever one works best for you to look at. Uh, in relation to what we just described, being at the corner of Cleveland and Old, Hay and Old Hayfield, uh, do you see where you all were at? With in that moment. Yes, I was in the park lot right here to the left side of this um, picture. And also, I'm going to, uh, there's a pointer up here that we may use a little bit. I'm going to give the, entrust this to you. Okay. Uh, and if you want, on the large one behind you, can you point out where you all was playing? I was back then, right here, to this uh, retainer wall. I was back then, right here. And what is that roadway to the right? Right, this is Old Hayfield Road. I'm going to publish uh, what's been previously admitted to State Exhibit 129, Charlie. It should come up on the screen in just one minute. Now, do you see in this photograph the coin laundry where you were parked, the general area? It's right up here to the right corner. And do you see where that car is on the left side of State Exhibit 129, Charlie? Right here? Yes. Yes. What is uh, over in that area? This apartment complex. What apartment complex is it? In Somerdale. Now, Commons. Somerdale Commons? Yes. Now, have you ever responded to that apartment complex in your career working in Zone 3? Yes, I have. And how are the apartment buildings in that complex identified? Is it numbers? Is it letters? Buildings? Yes. Um, and that particular location is on numbers. I'm going to also publish what's been marked as state or already admitted as state's exhibit 131, Charlie. 
Now, do you see the entrance to the Somerdale apartment we were just discussing? Depicted in this photograph? Right over here. Now, imagine you're following this school bus straight. Do you see that school bus on, in the photograph? Yes, sir. If you drive past this entrance to Somerdale apartment we just discussed, what is the next, uh, if any, buildings that you encounter down this road? Uh, there's another set of apartment buildings over here. You can't hardly see it through the trees. So that would be on the left? Yes, sir. Are those uh, also a part of the Somerdale apartment complex? This is going to be another phase of it. And have you ever responded to calls in that portion of the Somerdale apartment? Yes, I have. And how are the buildings in that Somerdale apartment complex identified? Is it numbers? Is it letters? Those are going to be letters. And is there a building C in that portion of Somerdale apartment complex? Of course. Now, thank you, Officer Black. I'm going to turn your attention back to... <clears throat> yes, you may sit down. Uh, we, we may utilize some other uh, exhibits momentarily. Gotcha. So turning back to when you're in your patrol car with Officer Davis, were you in uniform? Yes. Was she in uniform? Yes. Were you in a marked patrol car? Yes. And if you can recall, what uh, what was your all's goal or what were you doing while you were parked in the coin box? Uh, we were just going to pull out on a direct patrol at that particular location. What is a, a direct patrol? Uh, basically, we were just posted up, actually just being visible within that area. You know, that's one of the like high crown locations within the zone. So we were just being visible, showing visibility. And uh, with who was driving? Uh, my trainee was um, Officer Davis. And where were you seated in the, in the patrol car? I was in the front passenger seat. Now, can you describe for the jury while you and Officer Davis are seated there, did, you, did anything unusual happen? Basically, we were sitting there, we were having a conversation. I was getting ready to pull out on a direct patrol. Uh, she heard gunshots. She actually did. I hear it. I heard it, but wasn't sure at the time because I was actually engaged in talking to her. So we both kind of got quiet. Then we started hearing the other type sounds. Um, I know I heard a sound and I thought it was possibly like a, a garbage truck dumping a, gump, a dumpster. I said, it sounded like a dumpster or something. Then we start hearing more sounds as it started getting closer. And then that's when I said, it sounded like it's getting closer. And then that thing, oh, a car just, just dropped to my right, just out of the sky. And then as it dropped to the ground or in the parking lot next to us, it went forward right into the um, corn laundromat. I'm going to publish what's been already admitted as states exhibit 33 chart. Now, with what you just described, do you see uh, where your patrol car was that day? Yes, sir, right here. And is that, do you see the car you just mentioned that crashed right next to y'all's patrol car? The red car that's directly in front of us, up against the um, coin laundry wall. Now, when this car, did the car land on your side, the passenger, or on driver's side? It landed on the passenger side. And you, is your, in, in this photograph, are both the front doors open in the patrol car? Yes. In relation to your passenger door open as depicted in this photograph, how close did that car come? They would have hit that door. And what was your initial reaction to seeing this? <clears throat> Uh, basically, I was very startled, I'll say that. Very startled. Now, I'm going to also publish what's been previously admitted as 31, Charlie. <laughs> Do you uh, recognize 31, Charlie, Officer Black? Yes. So, can you describe for the jury, after the vehicle lands and crashes into that coin laundry, what did you see that? Oh, uh, once it hit, there's like about four, maybe five, um, black males exited that vehicle. Um, I know there was one that was closer to me because basically it's just like a quick reaction. I just jumped out the vehicle. A trainee jumped out the vehicle. The closest guy I grabbed by the collar of his shirt, placed him, told him to get down to the ground. And when I looked back, my trainee, 
was like was about to pass the vehicle. Then I saw another male. Uh, basically, he already had gotten out the back seat on the passenger side of that red vehicle, and it almost like he was about to try to slip behind her if you didn't see him. And I told her to get him, get the one on the ground, get him. Now, uh, I want to break this down a little bit. Did you, where did the other males that you described you saw get out of the car go, other than the ones you and Officer Davis? Um, there were two others that facing this picture, they went towards the right. There was a retainer wall over here. They jumped the retainer wall and the fence you, on the right side. Can you use that pointer to uh, help describe what you just did? Thank you, sir. On the other side over here, and there's a fence over here. So I got one guy here. The other guy was like right here. She was like right here about, I guess she was about to pursue the other two that was running. But he was almost stuck behind, so I told her to grab the other guy that was coming here. And that's where she had him stop right here. And basically, that's where she had him at. And I told him to hold him right there while I had my guy. Now for the two males who scaled the fence, were they moving slowly or quickly? For what I can remember, pretty fast. Now, if you were, if I, if you were me facing, say the fence is right in front of me, these guys take away. Mm -hmm. If you were to scale that fence and go immediately to your left, what would you encounter? It's going to park a lot over in the very. What businesses are in that parking lot? It's like a, like a. I want to say like a hairstyling, hairstyling place over there. Um, I want to say like a school or something too, but I can't recall. It's a plaza. Have you driven by or been in that plaza before? Yeah, I have answered a um, call over there. Um, some thefts, they say wigs, hair supplies, stuff like that. I'm going to publish what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 132, Charlie. Do you recognize anything depicted in this exhibit? Officer Black? Yeah, this is the same parking lot I just pointed out right here. That's the back fence area right here. Like, right um, jump over there on the side. And is this, if you scaled that fence and went left, the area that you would end up at? Yes. Yeah, because that's the corn lounge area right here. And we was on that back side. So if he came, came to the left, this way he ended up there. I'm going to publish State's Exhibit 31, Charlie. Now, Officer Black, if you were to scale that fence and go to your immediate right, what building would you run into? Uh, it's just like backyards. Uh, from here? Correct. Yeah, it's fence. Well, the car right here went through it, whatever fence that was right here. But there's some old fences over here. You would have jumped in the backyard. So, it's like, let's say three houses. What's on the other side of those houses? The apartment phase, the, the, the other phase of Summerdale Commons. Is that the phase of Summerdale Commons that uses numbers or letters for the building? And letters. Could you get there on foot if you scaled that fence? Yes, you can. It's, I think it may be two fence you probably have to jump before you actually get to two, maybe three. The third one is probably separating uh, the residents, the houses, from the apartment complex. Now, uh, Officer Black, I'm going to approach with what is admitted for demonstrative purposes. The state's exhibit 150, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Oh, you may uh, take a seat momentarily. Thank you. Right. Now, take a look at that and let me know what you reviewed it. Okay. Uh, do you, uh, what is that? It's a map of that whole location that I was pointing out. Along with uh, Old Hayville, the apartment complexes, the phases, the first phase and the second phase, the laundromat, and wow. the parking lot of that, um, their plaza, right, on the side of or back of that laundromat. And how do you recognize it? Um, there's got the name of the streets on here, so I can see that. And also the buildings with the names of it, and I see Cleveland Avenue. 
Now, does that uh, depict how that area looked back on September 11, 2013 in general? I mean, it's a map of it. I mean, a lot changed, but yeah. In terms of relation to the coin laundry, the apartment complexes you discussed? Yes. Yeah. And is it a fair and accurate depiction of how that area looked back in 2013? Yes, sir, from what I'm looking at. Your Honor, at this time, the state moves to admit and have been safe since it's 150 Charlie. Any objection states 150 Charlie. Yes, can I take a look at what's um, certainly please. Can I step up? Yes. Yeah, it's exactly. I do have an objection, Judge, but some questions to the witness in regards to this this uh what's your found, objection, foundation. Oh all right. All right, you can ask him on cross, okay? All right. All right. Can I state on the record or can I step up and, and uh uh, put my complete objection on the record in regards to why there's a lack of foundation. He's laid a foundation. I I I concur. So I'm gonna I'm gonna overrule your objection at this point in time. Understood. Yeah, do you have another you have another objection you'd like to pose? Um no the, the base of the objection is foundation. Okay. I do not believe he's laid a proper foundation for for this photograph. I, I'm overruling that objection in case. That's for continuing right. objection. Okay. All right. So noted. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm going to admit that stage 150, Charlie, may be published as you see fit for demonstrative purposes. Thank you, Your Honor. The state is publishing state's exhibit 150, Charlie. Now, Officer Black, if you don't mind, I may have you stand up again and help orient us to this map. Yes. Uh, can you help uh, use that point or show us where the coin laundry is that you've been talking about in 150 Charlie? It's right over here. And where is the uh, Somerdale apartment complex that uh, uses the numbers for the building? Over here. And where is the second part of that Somerdale apartment complex? And so can you show what, if, if you were to scale the fence uh, that we had just discussed and take a right and run on foot, can you describe what direction of travel you would be with this? Uh, these are the residences here. They have fences separating from each other's property. If you jump the fence here, you're basically scaling the fences. All you got to do is just keep going southbound. This fence right here will get you to this problem. Now, uh, Officer Black, were either of the two males that hopped that fence ever detained that day? Um, from what I heard, I've never seen, I heard on radio, and I stand here, Jason. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to publish what's been already admitted as State's Exhibit 32 Charlie. Now, I wanted to take a step back to, you had described some of the males that were closer to you that you detained. Uh, can you use the pointer to describe where the male that you uh, encountered? Where were you all? I jumped out right here. They came out over here, so over here is uh... What side of the car did uh, that individual get out of? This side here from what I can remember. So the passenger side? Mm hmm And when you encountered him, was he injured? Oh, uh, yes. Do you recall where? Uh, in the back, upper back area. And was there any bleeding? Yes. I have blood all over my left forearm. Now, can you describe uh, about how tall was he? He's about my six three, six four. And about how much did he weigh? Well, I'm at three thirty, so somewhere close to that. I mean, I'm assuming. <laughs> so he's close to three hundred. So was he? Uh, so he was about your height and weight. Yes. Would you say you're small or tall? 
Compare to others? Compare to others. <laughs> Tall? All right. <laughs> uh, now, when you interact with him, did you have to uh, handcuff him? Oh, uh, yes. And where was uh, Officer Davis in relation to you all? Uh, so we was over here, she was over here. You probably can see a little blood trail right there, so that's what it is. And what did you see in regards to what she was doing with the individual she detained? Uh, basically, he was, um, I ain't going to say laid out. He was actually sitting up. Um, he didn't want her to leave his side. He was basically holding on to her, the pants leg around the ankles, asking her not to leave. Was he also injured? Yes, he was shot. Now, I'm going to publish what's been already admitted to State's Exhibit 36, Charlie. Uh, Officer Black, for 36, Charlie, what are those uh, on the on the ground? What, what is that? Red marks on the ground around this car. This blood over here. And do you know, in relation to the suspect you encountered, where the, the, this blood came from? Those this bullets? one from what my trainee had, because this way he came, this way he was sliding at. He was like going in this direction. I saw him like going behind her, so that's when I told her, get him. But she didn't see him at first. Did it initially appear like he was trying to get away? Um, to me, because. As she was going this way, he was coming this way like he was trying to go behind as if she wasn't paying attention. So if she didn't see me, I'm going to try to, you know, if I was him. That makes sense. I'm going to publish also what's already been admitted as 38, Charlie. Is this a uh, another depiction of what you were just discussing with blood on the ground? Yeah. But this way he was going in right here. And she was like coming this in this area. I'm going to publish what's already been admitted as 39, Charlie. Is that a close-up of those? Yeah, blue, yeah. That's where you come before here. Now, I'm going to publish what's also already been admitted as State's Exhibit 34, Charlie. Now, Officer Black, do you see the red vehicle in this photograph? Yes, sir. And do you see, what is that piece of metal on the back end of it? On the back of the car? Yes. The like trunk, I guess. And trunk. what is that uh, red mark kind of using this photograph kind of towards the right of that piece of the trunk? In the parking lot on the ground? Um, in the parking lot on the ground. Right here? Correct. That's blood. That's where that second individual is uh, bleeding out of. <laughs> I'm going to publish what's already been admitted to State Exhibit 35, Charlie. Is this a close-up of what you were just discussing? Yes, sir. That's why he was holding on to her, telling her not to leave. Now, uh, were any medical personnel? Yeah, they respond? eventually came out. Mm -hmm. And after you and uh, Officer Davis secured and helped get medical help for those individuals, did you have any other involvement with this crime scene? After that, no, because basically our detectives, they all just, whatever occurred, they all just popped up out of nowhere because I didn't know what was going on, honestly. Were you still a little bit maybe in shock of what happened? Uh, after standing there, things calmed down. I kind of looked at that particular, that red car. Then I looked at my patrol car, looked at the red car again, and then my patrol car, and I realized what could have went down if it was over just to the left. And I'm sitting up in that patrol car, so if it was over to the left, I wouldn't be here. But I will never forget that. One, one moment, sir. <clears throat> now, uh, Officer Black, do you wear glasses? Yes. Oh, you may sit down. Thank you for your patience, Officer Black. Now, do you wear glasses for... Is that for distances? Uh, yes. Yeah. Were you wearing glasses on September 11, 2013? Of course. Did you have them on when the car dropped out of the sky and landed next to you? Yes. Did you have them on when you saw the four to five black males run from that car after hitting the wall? Yes. How far were you from the red car when you saw the four to five black males run? Um, basically, probably just, I can't say if I was still in the car. A patrol car, or I was jumping out. That part I can't remember exactly. 
And I'm going to um, publish today's exhibit 31, Charlie. And ask you one last question, Officer Black. How far were you from this retaining wall in State's Exhibit 31, Charlie, when you saw the two black males scaled that pen? Um, I was still with the guy that I had put down on the ground. I did not try to leave him. So once I had him in my custody, that's why I stayed. And I just remember just looking up at him, but other than that, I just kept my attention on this guy. And did you have on your glasses when you saw them scale the fence? Yes. Thank you, Officer Black. Cross. Right answer. <laughs> Glad good afternoon, sir. Hey, how you doing? I am good. I'm good. You and I have met uh, before, right? Yes. About a day or two ago, we had a chance to chat outside. Yes. And you were kind enough to discuss with me um, your recollection of things that happened back in 2013. True? Yes. All right. Um, I think, and, and you tell me if I'm right or not, that we also talked about um, the description of the individuals that you saw on that day. Remember? Mm -hmm. And specifically, we talked about um, the gentleman that you grabbed a hold of, the guy who had, who had had the injury to the back. Yes. And just to be clear, he had a gunshot to the back, right? Yes. Okay. And the other guy who was on the on the ground next to the car that was um, that was, I guess, apprehended by Officer Davis um, was also suffering from a gunshot wound. Is that right? Yes. Okay. As a matter of fact, those uh, pictures that we saw up a little while ago with all the blood stains, that's where. Um, I think you used the word bleeding out. That's where your guy was bleeding out on kind of the left side, the back of the car, right? With my guy? Yeah. Yeah, he was bleeding in the back. Right, but in terms of... her guy was the one that was doing all the bleeding, so... He was the, he was the one on, on the ground. Yes. Um, the guy that you... Actually, let me back up a little bit, okay? Let me kind of start from the beginning. You and Davis are sitting in the car, right? Yes. Um, this car comes kind of flying out of nowhere, lands on the on the ground, and ends up smack against the uh, the launcher mat. True. Yes. Okay. Um, you see individuals get out of the car. Yes. And run. Right. Your description or your recollection is that it's four, maybe five individuals. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, the person who Officer Davis ended up uh, apprehending or, or interacting with. That person got out of the rear passenger seat of the car. Is that right? That's where I've seen him at, yes. Okay, that's where you saw him at. Um, fair to say that person didn't get very far. No. All right. Um, he, the gunshot that he had was to, was it to the leg, the groin area, something like that? Yeah, it was to the groin area now. Which side? I can't say. Okay. But, but he, <laughs> he wasn't very mobile. True? No. Okay. All right. So we know that that guy um, who was in the car is out and he's laying on the ground. He had on a red shirt, did he not? I don't remember. Okay, all right. The guy who um, got out of the car that you grabbed a hold of, where did he? Where was he in the car? Do you recall? No, I don't recall which. If he was in the front, back, not sure. Okay, but he was a big guy. Yes. He was easily over six feet tall. Yes. Um, now I heard a. Uh, 300 pounds thrown around a while ago. He was in the area of about 300 pounds. So it can be 280, 3, 305, 310. So he was a big guy. Yeah. You're a big guy. Yeah. I think you told me the other day, you're a little bigger now than you were back then. Back then you were kind of slimmer, trimmer, that sort of thing. My words. And yeah. You were small. Well, I'd say more toned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, you got, you've gotten six fine over there. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, but it was a big. He was a big dude. Yeah. And he had a gunshot to the back. Mm -hmm. He was bleeding as well. Mm -hmm. I thought he was close to like shoulder blade areas. Okay. One of the things I think you testified to, and maybe you told me also, is that you were holding him, and it was after a while that you realized you had blood all over your your arm that was coming from him. From yeah, from when I grabbed him to the back of his collar. <laughs> He had on a blue shirt. It was like a light blue. Okay. So we've got the guy on the ground with Davis who has on a shirt. You don't remember the color, right? But you know that the big guy who got out of wherever in the car he got out, he had on a blue shirt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, 
there were other individuals, you said four, maybe five altogether, right? But at, at least two others you saw go towards the right of, of where the car landed, right? Yes. All right. Would I be correct in, in saying that you, you don't really have, you can't recall a good description of those individuals? No. If I were to ask you what they were wearing, you couldn't recall? No, sir. If I were to ask you what they looked like, hairstyle, that sort of thing, you couldn't really recall? No. Okay. Um, were you aware of someone else with a blue shirt being apprehended somewhere around the corner? No. Okay. Um, the vehicle that uh, that was crashed against the, the the laundromat, it was kind of a small car, right? Was it, what was it an Altima? I don't, I don't remember the make a model. It wasn't a big car. No, it wasn't a big large sedan. It was okay. four doors. Okay. Um, it's fair to say that he, your role in this kind of started with that car coming over and, and dropping there on, on the ground and ended with you and Davis um, kind of interacting with and apprehending these two individuals. Yes. Right? Um, you didn't conduct any additional investigation. No. Right? Oh, the laundromat. Um, you're familiar with that laundromat, and you were familiar with it back then, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, are you aware of whether there are um, cameras in that laundromat, or in or around that laundromat? No, I don't recall. Okay. You're not saying that they're not, you just, you don't recall? No. Okay. And and, and granted, this was a little over 10 years ago, fair? Mm hmm Okay. Um, would I be correct in, in saying that you're not sure about whether or not there were cameras on the on the side of the laundromat closer to that uh what you described as a retaining wall. Mm -hmm. All right. Did you have any interaction with the um other detectives or investigators who showed up on the scene? I mean they all showed up on scene. It was all right there in the parking lot. Okay. And I was just trying to find out what was going on. Okay. Um did you have any conversations with with any detectives or any any other officers about um, about uh, getting video from the owner of the laundromat? No. Did you have any conversations with that? No, I don't recall any. No. Did you talk to or do you, you know Officer uh, Detective Quinn? Mm hmm. D did Did you see him on that day? I can't. I don't remember. Okay. What about Velasquez? You know Velasquez? Yes. Okay. Did you have conversation with him on that day? I don't remember. Okay. There is a crime scene. Well, was there a crime scene unit that showed up on the scene? Yes. Okay. Um, you would not have had any interaction with the crime scene unit, correct? No, uh, I really don't have no recall of that either. All I remember is just dealing with what we was dealing with right there, but as for investigation purpose wise, wasn't you? No. Okay. All right. You don't know what happened before that car came sailing out of the sky, right? What was going on with the car? No. Okay. Um, the the photo um, that you were showing earlier, and if I can have uh, uh, photo one, I think that's one fifty C. Put back up for me, please. All right, you can see it on the on the screen next on to your left. Yes. All right. This is a an overhead, um, kind of like a satellite um, depiction of the the entire area. Is that right? Yes. This is um. You would agree with me. This is a depiction from the common day, from today, from the two thousand and what would it be twenty four two thousand twenty four, right? With the green trees. Yeah. Well. Okay. Maybe. Some well, time, no. All right, let me let me put it this way. Right, <laughs> <laughs> it is winter time. Um, the trees are green. Yes, um, this is not what the area looked like back in two thousand and thirteen. Am I? Am I? Is it fair to say? I mean, it was, it was different. I know it used to be a McDonald's, but I can't remember if the McDonald's was there then either. Okay, fair to say that looking at this at this picture, you can you know it and you know the area because you patrol that area. You've been there since. Four. Yeah. Okay. So, so you can look at this photograph and you can say, well, that's a Summerdale Commons apartment complex, and you can see where the Skyline laundromat is. But, but the truth is, as we're looking at it, 
you can't see the fences that you're talking about that you have to navigate to get from one location to the next, true? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, and although we we see Cleveland Avenue, we see, um, you see what I read, the red uh, pin, whatever they call it, yeah. is? All right. That, that's essentially indicating where the entrance to, the, to that part of Somerdale Commons apartment is, right? Mm-hmm. All right. But it's fair to say that you can't see, like you see where the laundromat is, but you don't see the houses that are obscured by the trees right in front of the laundromat, right? I can see two. Okay, you talking about the ones with the red tops? Um, there's a space, but I'm not sure. But there's a space. Want me to show it up here? All right, can, can I approach with the test? You may, sir. All right. All right, I'm going to play teacher for a second. I'm going to use this. Turn around for me if you get a chance, okay? All right, so that's not the laundromat, right? No. No? No. Who is the laundromat? The red and blue. Right here? There it is. Okay, so that's the laundromat. Yeah. And this is... The tree is covering that um, part of the uh, balloons. Uh, yeah. Right here, right? Mm -hmm. And then, aren't there some houses like right here? Yeah, I'm thinking that's a house right in that little space. Okay, but you can't really see that, right? No. Okay, but there's some house, there's a house here, uh -huh. there's a fence here, <laughs> yep. and then there's a wall that comes down. That's where you guys were sitting in the car, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you recall um, uh, helicopter units that, that came out on that day? Yeah. You do? Yeah, because that's when all the noise and stuff started. Okay. Like everything was quiet then. Like everything just broke out. Next thing you know, you got a car dropping out of the sky. No, I'm talking about after that. Then you got helicopters flying up above. Yeah. Okay. Again, though, you weren't involved with that portion of it in terms of looking for anyone or anything like that, right? Who? Do you know, you know who um, Officer Bridget Porter is? Yeah, she's an investigator. Investigator. Uh, she was, do you recall seeing her on that day? Yes. Okay. Um, and you were subpoenaed to come here to testify. You were outside in the hallway, right? So yeah. You were subpoenaed to come and testify, and before you came in, you were outside in the hallway. Yes. Okay. You see Bridget Porter out there? No. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Any further cross? Mr. Sharp? Good afternoon, sir. Hey, how you doing? Wonderful. How are you? Okay. Does Investigator Porter still work for APD? Yes. So she's local? That part, I don't know what department that she's in, but she's, she's an investigator with us, yes. For Atlanta Police Department? Yes. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Any redirect, sir? Briefly, Your Honor. Officer Black, we say this is in the 150 Charlie we were just discussing with Mr. Adams. How do you know that you can get from coin laundry to that second portion of the Somerville apartment complex on foot? How do I know? Yeah. I've seen the fence. Uh, yeah, it's the fence that basically separating those houses, backyards, that leads right on over to them. The second phase over there of um, apartments, and there's a fence that's separating the apartment building and that last house just north of the uh, complex. Is the fence as you just discussed any higher or longer than the fence you would have had to initially scale to get over right where your car crashed? Well, the fence that's at the country, the lawn, I mean, the laundromat, the coin laundry place, is high with uh, wires on it. Those are just regular chain link fence to the backyards of um, people's property. So now they're basically short. Thank you, Officer Black. No further questions, Your Honor. Anything further, Mr. Adams? I've got one last question. All right. Okay, two last questions. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Officer Black, we'll see. Yeah, do my best. Um, um, <laughs> The, when you saw the other individuals who got out of the car and, and went to the right, you don't know where they went, do you? Well, I know they went to the fence, that's it. All right. That's all, thank you. All right, sir.
Are you sure anything else? Oh, no. Anyone else? <clears throat> all right. Anything further, Mr. Uh, Atkins? No, you're on. All right. Uh, all right. At this point in time, may Senior Patrol Officer Black be permanently temporarily excused the witness. Permanently, Your Honor. All right, Officer Black, appreciate your patience with us. I'm going to go ahead and permanently excuse you as a witness. You're free to go about your user duties and advocation. Just don't discuss your testimony with anybody except the attorneys in this case, okay? Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. All right. Do you have another witness ready? We do. He's coming down. Um, if the court would afford us two minutes to make sure he's downstairs. All right. There he is. He's here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. State and who, cause, who are you summoning next? State calls Detective Vin Vincent Velasquez. All right, Detective Velasquez, if you can please approach the witness stand. Yes. Once you get there, before you sit down, turn and face our name and respond to the witness, sir. Right. I do. Vincent Velasquez, V E L A Z Q U E Z. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. And is you detective? Uh, no, ma'am. I'm uh, retired. All right. What do you do now professionally? Uh, right now, I am the owner of a security consulting business, Velasquez Consultants. And what do you do as the owner of Velasquez Consultants? Uh, so I do a variety of things uh, under the umbrella of the business. Um, I do expert witness work for civil cases, wrongful death, uh, sexual assault, police procedures cases. I do security evaluations. Also, under the umbrella, I hold the title of Director of Security for the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, team security, excuse me, director of team security. Uh, and I've had that position for the last eight years. What the professional background do you have that qualifies you to do what you do with the Hawks and as the owner of security? Uh, so I was a police officer for 22 years with Atlanta PD, uh, starting in 1995 until my retirement in 2017. And as a police officer with the Atlanta Police Department, what areas of the department did you work with him? I started my career uh, as a patrol officer working downtown in Midtown Atlanta. I did that for about a year. And then from there, I went to a tactical drug unit called Red Dog in 1997. Um, and I stayed in that unit for two and a half years until the year of 2000. Uh, I did a brief stint as a background investigator for police applicants for about six months and I was promoted to detective in November of 2000, went to homicide and have been staying in homicide for my entire career, 17 years, or the rest of my career. Now, no longer working as a detective with the city of Atlanta, does any of your professional work involve any of the cases that you worked while at the city of Atlanta currently? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Does any of the work that you do now, outside of being a detective with the Atlanta Police Department, does any of the work that you do now have anything to do with the cases that you work at the City of Atlanta Police Department? Do you have any yes. Okay. Uh, so I also have a TV show uh, that highlighted my, myself and Detective David Quinn was my partner for 17 years. Uh, so the TV show under the auspice of my business. Uh, was for four seasons, highlighting uh, the cases we worked, the solved cases that we had. Uh, each episode is about a case, the victim, how we solved it. Um, we've been doing that for the last four years. And to show those episodes, do you revisit or review any of the files that you worked during that time? We do. Laying a foundation for other questions. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of light to know who you wish. You may answer that question. Yes, we do. During your time with the Atlanta Police Department, were you certified as a law enforcement officer by the state of New York? I was. 
How long did you retain your certification? Throughout my career, 22 years. Did you ever lose your certification as a law enforcement officer? No. During your time with the Atlanta Police Department, did you work any cases involving the residents of Zone 3 in Atlanta? Yes. Are you able to give a number to how many cases you worked involving residents of Zone 3? Hundreds, over 300. Well, combined from when I was in Red Dog, we were in Zone 3 heavily, and then throughout my career in homicide, cases where I either was lead detective, assisting detective, or even witnesses to other homicides, uh, residents that lived in Zone 3, so I spent a lot of time in Zone 3. And you said you spent a lot of time in Zone 3. Did you interact with the residents of Zone 3 during that time? Yes. In what ways? Interviews, uh, knock and talks, neighborhood canvases, uh, um, homicides, actual homicide scenes, and um, spent a lot of time knocking on doors. Was every person that you interviewed in Zone 3 a suspect in a murder? Oh, no. A state. Can you give a number for how many residents of Zone 3 you've interacted with as an officer and a detective and now as your time? Outside of law enforcement, if I had to guess, I would say well over three or four hundred people. And did you ever have occasion to visit the homes of the residents of Zone Three that you communicated with? Many times. Are you able to give a number to how many homes within Zone Three that you had occasion to visit? Your Honor, I'm Session Foundation. I can approach. Yeah, could you please? Yes.
knife coming at the officer, just as a few examples. That would be, those instances I just explained would be called an aggravated assault. So that has to be investigated. To answer that question, it depends on the detective and homicide. It depends on the complexity of the precipitating crime that occurred. And the example I gave was aggravated assault. There were detectives that were assigned to the precinct. Zone one had their own detectives and they would cover robberies and they would cover um, burglaries and thefts and things of that nature, and, and as well as aggravated assaults. The homicide detective could make the decision depending on the actual complexity of that particular case, whether they want to handle the precipitating crime investigation or working in conjunction with the precinct detective. And we were talking zone three, so as an example, zone three detective could have worked the robbery or an ag assault while homicide worked just the police shooting or homicide detective can make the decision, I'm going to investigate the entire incident from start to finish. Would the officer who was involved in the shooting be allowed to continue to investigate any alleged crime that led to the shooting? No. Why not? So it, it's the general feeling that the officer that's involved in the shooting, we, we have to, as Thomas, I have to make a determination whether that officer acted negligently. If that officer did, as an example, I can give you a plain example. There's a threat. Officer said, I was fear of my life and I shot. We determined that the threat ended way before the officer shot. Then that officer could be charged with aggravated assault. We take the officer out of that mix because we want them. It would be difficult for that officer to remain objective in investigating the own crime, the, the, the precipitating crime that led to them to make a decision to fire their weapon. Therefore, they are completely removed from that whole scenario. So as OIS, the officer involved shooting team, uh, would you have to make determinations sometimes whether an officer acted criminally or the criminal? That is exactly what we do. Our, our investigation is a criminal investigation. Simultaneously, Internal Affairs is doing an administrative investigation. Um, so while we are trying to determine if the officer acted criminally, Internal Affairs is investigating whether the officer violated policy. The officer could have violated policy, as an example, could have had the wrong ammunition in their weapon. Doesn't change what happened, but they're not following policy, or they may not have had their right equipment on their duty belt that day. Internal Affairs would look at that and make those determinations. We solely looked at was the officer's actions lawful? And if they were, well, regardless of what they were, we turn our findings over to the district attorney's office. Did you investigate an incident that occurred on September 11, 2013, and that involved investigator Malik Roberson in the office? I was involved in parts of that investigation, yes. Were you the lead investigator? I was not. Who was the lead investigator? Detective David Quinn. How did you become involved? As, as a member of the team, the officer Bob shooting team, uh, if we're all at work at the same time, we'll typically all go to the scene together as a team. It, within that mini uh, squad within homicide, there's a rotation. So homicide has their own rotation where the next homicide that occurs, whoever's on call within that rotation gets that. Within the officer involved shooting team, whoever within that team is next up, David Quinn happened to be up that day. He then uh, asked me to handle the actual shooting location once we learned there were multiple locations involved in this case. What was the location that you were tasked with investigating? It was 2475 Old Hayville Road, Somerdale, Commons Apartments. Besides yourself, what other OIS team members responded? Or officer involved shooting team members responded to the shooting incident itself? I recall uh, David Quinn and myself initially responding just to the shooting location at the apartment complex at first. Okay. Now, were there any factors involved in that September 11, 2013 incident 
that led to the officer involved shooting team handling both the shooting that occurred and the incident that was alleged to have precipitated the shooting, which was uh, an aggravated assault. So there was a conversation once we understood uh, the complexity of what was happening because there were multiple crime scenes. And I say that to mean there was a crime scene where the shooting occurred. There was a crime scene where a vehicle struck a gate, caused damage. There were other, uh, there was another area where a vehicle crashed into uh, a laundromat. So based on that, and I recall a discussion with Detective Quinn, it was decided, he decided that he was going to handle the entire investigation. Now, did you all get a call on the radio when you were notified about the officer involved shooting with respect to investigator Ruby Robertson Hale? Yes. What is a 63? Uh, signal 63 is when an officer, we, we speak in signals and codes. <clears throat> so a signal 63 is when an officer needs immediate help. And typically it's an emergency, emergency situation where they just give their location and yell signal 63. And that indicates any officers hearing this to head to that location for assistance. And in September 11th of 2013, did the Atlanta Police Department have only one channel for radio traffic? No. Would you describe the various channels for the jury? There's, there was and still is to this day six precincts, six zones, zone one through six. Each zone has its own radio frequency. Detective radio has its own, has had its own frequency. Special operations had their own frequencies. And then there's sub frequencies within those channels I just described for surveillance. As an example, if I'm on detective radio, uh, there are other detectives trying to talk to a dispatcher and I wanted to talk to, since we're talking Detective Quinn, I call him on the radio and I want to talk about something that I don't need to tie up the radio with. I would say switch to surveillance. So Detective Radio would have a surveillance channel. We would switch it there and have a, it's not private, anyone can switch over and listen, but we're not tying up traffic. Every zone had that. Every special operations radio frequency has that. And then there were several other channels that they call TAC channels or talk around channels where I could call a detective or an officer from another zone and ask them to switch over to TAC 1 or TAC 2 so I could have a semi-private conversation and not tie up their radio frequency or my own. Would it have been uncommon in an incident such as the one you responded to on September 11, 2013 to divert radio traffic to a TAC channel? No, it was very common for that to happen. And were there any circumstances involved in that incident to which you responded that <laughs> that would have led to um, the traffic being switched to attack channels? Yes, I do believe that there was some direction for all units on the scene to switch to a TAC channel. I don't recall which TAC channel that was. When you did respond to the incident on uh, September 11, 2013, would you tell the jury what you did? When I arrived on scene, first of all, from the radio traffic, I understood what I was looking for. I knew there was a shooting, and just knowing when a gun is fired, the shell cases that come out. So um, upon arrival, I'm, my expectations were met that the crime scene was restricted by yellow police tape. There were several uniform officers restricting access. I arrived at Summerdale Commons apartments. Uh, I could clearly see the gate. Uh, one of the gates, I believe, was the exit gate. Looked mangled, like it had just been rammed by something. And then I entered the crime scene through the yellow tape and met with, I believe Detective Quinn may have been there already or we arrived simultaneously in separate cars. There was an officer who I do not recall the name in uniform who was maintaining that scene and then started to uh, direct me in some evidence that they found shell casings. There were just debris on the ground. And uh, at that point, I started to disevaluate what would be next as far as collecting evidence. Did you call for a crime scene technician? I did. Now, what did crime scene technicians do that you weren't able as an investigator to do? Crime scene technicians are 
and the Atlanta Police Department are civilian employees that are trained in evidence collection, identification, processing, fingerprinting, super gluing things for fingerprints, photographing. Our crime scene unit did just that. That's what they're, they're tasked with doing. Every homicide scene, there is a crime scene tech or several techs on scene. And what they do is at our direction, start to process the crime scene as we start to identify evidence. It could be blood, could be a weapon, it could be bullet casings or bullets or damage. And at our direction, they take photographs, measurements, and then eventually actually collect that evidence physically and take it with them to be processed later. And it could be either processed by themselves, they have their own crime lab, APD did at the time, or send it to the GBI, which is the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, or sometimes even to the FBI. Who was the crime scene technician that you called to assist you on September 11th, 2013? Uh, her last name is Ote, O-T-E-Y. And did Ote carry out duties only did she, did she decide on her own what to photograph or what not to, or was that done under your direction? It is done under my direction. However, Ote was a very experienced crime scene technician. We worked together for many, many years. At that point, I had been in homicide 13 years. So it's not uncommon. And in this particular instance, I did not direct her to take every single photograph. I trusted, and to this day still do, that she knew what photographs I needed. But there was direction. There were some directions as I started to find casings and debris where I probably said, I need you to really focus on this or get a close up of the casing. But there were many other photographs of the area and the crime scene that she was taking on her own. So, yes, John. Thank you, John. How about a break? For me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. You know, oh, pure. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a ten-minute break, take comfort, and um, and we'll come back and continue with our examination. Okay. Um, I'll rise for our jury, please. Ladies and gentlemen, our jury has left us uh, retired detective glasses. You can take 10 minutes, okay? Thank you. And uh, everybody else, I'll see you back in 10 minutes.